first, I just want to say I'm so excited to uh, to be here today. And I, what I wanted to come on and talk to you about is female energy. And this picture really spoke to me because I feel like as women, we are so we are so uh, caught up in the busyness of life that we often uh, divorce ourselves from our own bodies. And what I wanted to really talk about today was how we can be. Uh, thinking about how we can harness energy, how we can be creating it. What are some of the distinctions between men and women in terms of our physiology, uh, in terms of our nutrition, in terms of our circadian biology, even our, uh, our organs, some of our organs are even different. And when we're talking about uh, energy and the creation of energy, just so everybody's on the same uh, page here, we want to think about uh, energy being made from precursors. And when I say precursors or substrates, that's basically what I'm talking about. It's either you're taking energy in from the external world, so your diet, so your dietary fats, your dietary carbohydrates, your dietary proteins, or you're going to draw on your own resources for creating energy from your own stored food uh, in your body. As much as it would be great for us to, once we've eaten the amount of calories that we need for our body to just get rid of it, the body doesn't do that. She is a hoarder, so she will hold on to energy and she will store it in the form of glycogen, which is the stored form of glucose. So we find glycogen primarily stored in the liver. We also see it in abundance in muscle tissue as well. And there's sort of an upper limit to the amount of glycogen that we can store. And once we've maxed that out, then she, our bodies will start to store it in our adipose tissue or our, commonly known as our fat. But I like the word adipose because sometimes we mix up the macronutrient fat with uh, the state of being or having excess adiposity. So we store in our adipose uh, tissues something called triglycerides. And chemically, if you look at, you know, if you sort of look at the structure of that, it's three fatty acids plus a glycerin um, backbone. So those are kind of the two places that we derive our energy from. Now, as women, of course, at, when we're thinking about how we are distinct in terms of how we create energy, we have a very distinct hormonal environment, right? So one of the most obvious distinctions is our menstrual cycle. So that would be, uh, or, and we're also going to, uh, for all the ladies that are listening who are like, well, I don't have a period anymore. I'm menopausal. We're also going to break that out and some uh, contingency, contingency plans for you as well. But for women who are under about the age of 50, right, we have daily t changes in our hormonal uh, milieu. So Estrogen uh, fluctuates daily, testosterones, uh, our progesterone, and men don't have that daily flux. They're sort of steady state all through the month, all through the year, all through their years. Some of the other ways that we are different as women is even some of the hormones that we share that are the same in women and men, we, uh, we behave and we, we respond to them differently. So there's many of them, but the two that I really wanted to punch out today and talk about in terms of understanding our metabolism and how we're uh, unique is leptin and ghrelin. So these are metabolic hormones that are involved in uh, keeping us uh, either feeling that we're hungry. So ghrelin is like the little gremlin in your stomach uh, that makes you feel like you want to pick up the fork. And leptin, which is actually secreted from our fat tissue, our adipose tissue, tells you to put the fork down. So that's involved in satiety and feeling full. So we're going to talk about those metabolic hormones. And then I also want to talk about cortisol as well. So cortisol is often referred to as our stress hormone. I think she gets a bad rap, but we're going to talk a little bit about stress and how we are wildly, we are much more different as females in terms of our cortisol uh, presentation um, than our male counterparts. And then I just want to point out a couple of organs that are different as well, because we think about, well, a lot of times the assumption is, well, women are just like little men, right? We're just like smaller versions of men with these like extra pesky hormones. And it's actually not true. When we think about, when we look at our liver, uh, there's a tremendous signature difference between the genes that are turned on and off in the female liver versus the male liver. And this, we see this with growth hormones. So the, um, the pattern of secretion of growth hormone uh, from the liver in females is much different uh, than men. 
And then also our brains are very different. There are areas in our brain that are exquisitely sensitive or more sensitive to estradiol, and when we, which is um, one of the estrogens. And when you have that in abundance, you will create growth in those areas. And then there are other areas that are more sensitive to testosterone. So um, I just wanted to, we, I'm, I could go on a, probably on a nerd safari on all of those things, but just to, just to sort of paint the picture that even though we have a lot of the same body parts, there's a lot of differences in terms of the way that um, we function. So let's talk a little bit about leptin and ghrelin. So the first thing I, I just want to point out is that women in general, we are much more defensive of our fat stores, okay? So if we take an evolutionary lens to that, we that makes sense because we have the privilege of birthing life and continuing the human race. So if there is a shortage, an unexpected shortage of food, we are going to we are going to hold on to our fat like an insurance policy, right? So that we can use that fat in order to nur if there is pregnancy, uh, in order to nourish and, and feed that developing uh, baby. So let's talk a little bit about the differences in terms of ghrelin and the differences in terms of leptin. And there was a couple of questions that came in that I'd like to kind of tie into this now. And when we think about ghrelin, this is, like I said, it's the gremlin, it's secreted from your stomach. It's like, pick up the fork, mama's hungry. Now, when we are calorie restricting, and this is something that women have done for forever, right? When, as soon as, you know, we had that industrialization come in and like the thinner, uh, more slender, uh, um, body type came into fashion, women started calorie restricting. And of course, now uh, you would be living under a rock if you haven't heard of fasting. But the way that we are, because of that, our fat, we are much more defensive of our fat. Females who calorie restrict over the long term or who engage in long-term fasting. And when I say long-term, I'm talking about uh, longer, consistently longer than 24 hours. Um, and I'll kind of get, I'll try to get, I'll, I'll try to stay off my soapbox when we talk about, you know, men that are like, hey, we're going to do a five-day fast, who's in? It's like, oh my God, no, don't women, no, please stop. Because we will hit that hunger point much sooner than our male counterparts. Meaning that if you are fasting, for a long period of time, or if you are calorie restricting, so you're restricting your calories, your body knows it much faster than the male body does. So it's going to be like, no, uh, 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 we need food right now. So that's how we, that's, there's a distinction there in terms of our ghrelin secretion. And the same is also true for our leptin. So if you remember, I was saying ghrelin picks the fork up, leptin puts the fork down. So leptin is secreted from our fat cells. And I'll just, um, switch this here for you so you can kind of see um, sort of what happens with leptin. So leptin, when we are eating, normally when you eat a normal amount of food, leptin will be secreted from your, from your fat cells, your adipose cells, and it'll go up to the brain and area, uh, so areas in the brain that are regulated with appetite control. And it will say, put the fork down, you've had enough food. Now, the difference is between men and women, and this is really important for us to know, is that at any given measure of obesity or BMI, any given measure of weight, men uh, have exhibited lower levels of leptin. Lower levels of leptin compared to women. What does that mean? It means that they don't need to secrete as much leptin in order for their brain to say, huh, I'm full. Women, on the other hand, for whatever reason, we are much more likely, we have a, we have a bigger tendency to be leptin insensitive or uh, leptin resistant. So what that means is as you are eating and leptin is being secreted from your fat cells, it will get to the brain, but then there's, there's like a disrupted signal there. The brain doesn't pick it up as much. So you continue to eat because you are not feeling full. And of course, when you are consuming excess calories over the long term, there's that thermogenic, um, what we have an imbalance between calories in and calories out, then you'll begin to uh, gain weight. 
So it's very similar when we think about leptin resistance. This is very similar to uh, insulin insensitivity, right? We think about, we understand this idea that when you have too much insulin around, your uh, cells are less sensitive to the, uh, to the physiological effects of it. The same is true for women with leptin. With more leptin, we are, uh, we don't, we are not as sensitive as our male counterparts. And of course, what happens? We put on more fat, right? We put on more adipose tissue in order to be able to secrete more and more um, leptin. So just for all my nerds who want to kind of know the, uh, uh, and my like nerd army who want to know uh, what are some of the effects that leptin has in the body, it is not, it is, of course, there's a big regular, there's an appetite uh, component to it and energy homeostasis, but leptin is actually involved in a lot of different uh, systems in the body in terms of bone mass, in terms of thyroid health, in terms of pancreatic function, um, et cetera. So I wanted to point that out because we're getting to, and I promise I'm going to be getting to solutions, right? It's not just like, oh, well, like throw my hands up in the air. My leptin doesn't work. So I just might as well eat everything. Uh, there are things that we can do to help improve our leptin sensitivity. Uh, before we get there, I do want to just talk a little bit about the differences in terms of our cortisol management. So if we kind of bring in what we've been talking about with leptin, right? We know that by default, because we are, we, females have a more, um, where uh, our tendencies to be more leptin insensitive, we are already going to be in a state of chronic low grade inflammation and stress. And I use those words uh, interchangeably. So when we talk about stress and inflammation, for me, it's, it's one and the same. So we already have a tendency to put on more adipose tissue, which of course is pro-inflammatory, pro-inflammation, pro-stress. But for females in particular, particularly when we get to our 30s, now of course there's outliers on, on either side, you know, but typically women in their 30s are thinking about, if you're thinking about children, this is typically when you get pregnant. We have pregnancies, we have labor, we have delivery, we have recovery. And then we have this like 18 year, at least 18 year span of sleep deprivation. You know, in layman's terms, it's called parenting, you know, but we are basically sleep deprived for, you know, at least 18 years uh, after that. It's like a new level of tired that you never knew was possible. And even for the ladies that are listening that you've never had children, right? Or that's not in your, that's not in your life plan. It, data suggests that you are likely doing, you are likely burning the candle at both ends as well. So you are going to work, you're working on your career, and we're not even going to talk about the, uh, the gender and the pay inequality gap, but you're going and you're working your butt off at work. And data suggests that you are also doing the majority of unpaid work in the home as well. So you clock in, you know, the nine to five or the nine to nine or whatever, whatever it is, and you come home and then you have to grocery shop, you have to cook, you have to clean, you have to do your laundry. And when I look at uh, 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 census, um, census from the United States, Canada, I've looked at Britain as well. Estimates are women do upwards of 70% of that unpaid work. So even if you are even if you're like, well, I don't have kids, I don't have to worry about the, you know, the nutritional uh, deficit that I'm going to be in in order to carry this baby, deliver this baby, breastfeed this baby. You're also working overtime, and um, I always, uh, whenever I, whenever I present to, sometimes I'll go into corporations and present to female um, uh, CEOs and 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 a group of people. I will ask them. I'll just kind of list, and I'll do this for your audience as well. I think it will be, uh, I think this will be a fun experiment. So I'm going to list a couple of things now, and I just want you to take note, just kind of like a mental uh, check mark, whether or not you've experienced, if you're a woman, uh, any of these things in the last week. Okay. So, and and I'll I'll also just say I usually can't get through this list without all the hands in the room being up. So things like brain fog, if you've experienced that in the last week. Needing coffee to get you going in the morning. This is where most of the hands kind of you know, slowly come up. Uh, energy dips in the day, usually after lunch, somewhere between lunch and 3 p.m. Uh, difficulty falling asleep. You feel like your mind is racing. You're worrying about the day or worrying about tomorrow. Difficulty maintaining sleep. You're having dreams that are waking you up or you're just sort of popping up, waking up, usually between the hours of 2 and 4 in the morning. Um, inability to lose weight, no matter what you do, right? Like you're doing keto, you're doing fasting, you're calorie restricting, you're doing whatever program and you're still, you, you have this plateau. 
um, needing to snack or eat frequently or moodiness, right? So these, this list, you can kind of see uh, how that might be applicable to probably, you know, if my estimates are correct, you know, most women, right? And it's this constant low grade stress. We are running on, and we, we tend to blame our adrenals. And there was a question that came in around uh, adrenal fatigue. And I'll just take a moment to address that nomenclature because I'm a bit of a word nerd. And adrenal fatigue is uh, a term that we typically use uh, in complementary and, um, and uh, alternative medicine. Uh, we typically will use the word adrenal fatigue. There's not a lot of literature that actually, if you go onto PubMed and you type in adrenal fatigue, you actually don't really find that. What you do find, those symptoms that I just read out to you, those are really consistent with something called chronic fatigue syndrome or CFS or burnout syndrome, right? Because I don't like this idea that we're always blaming our adrenals. Like our adrenals get a bad rap and you often will hear people say, oh, like my adrenals are shot. Like, oh, my adrenal fatigue. It's, it's really, the adrenals are part of a larger system in the body. Uh, called your sympathetics uh, or your sympathetic nervous system. And there's two kind of main branches uh, of that. Uh, so we have this autonomic nervous system, sounds like automatic, right? Because it happens without our voluntary control. We have one branch called the sympathetic nervous system, which is uh, often called your stress response. And then we have your para sympathetic, which is your rest, digest, stay, and play, right? That's where we d digest our food. That's where our immune function, that's where we repair. And often in modern life, what tends to happen is whether or not you have children, uh, but if you have children, it's an extra level of, of, uh, of attention, is we get stuck in our sympathetics. We get stuck in, if you think about a car, you know, you have a gas pedal and a brake, we get stuck with our foot on the gas pedal, and it's usually pedal to the metal, right? We become addicted to the stress. We come, become addicted to the adrenaline rush. We become addicted to being busy. And um, I, I, I want to just kind of break this out and say, like, adrenal fatigue. The word adrenal fatigue is. Um, I understand what it means, and I use the word too because I want to be able to communicate and express to people. We want to make sure that we're talking about uh, the same thing, but what is more appropriate is sympathetic dominance, right? Or hypothalamic pituitary axis dysfunction or HPA. So you want to try and say that five times fast to impress your friends, you can, or we can just say HPA axis, right? So we're talking about sympathetic dominance being always in go, go, go mode. And the issue with that especially for females, is we forget how to relax. We forget what pleasure is. We forget what brings us joy, right? So if I, if I paint a picture for you, if you are someone, let's call you somewhere between 30 and 55 or 60, you know, you're a, you're a mother, you have one or more children, uh, you've had the physical and chemical stress of being pregnant, you've had the physical and chemical stress of labor and delivery, of breastfeeding, sleepless nights, trying to balance your career, parenting challenges, relationship challenges, you know, we used to grow up with other women, right? We used to have other women help us raise our babies. And it is often the case now that we are just going, we are riding solo and we are doing it ourselves. And this is what is leading to this chronic fatigue. And we have much wilder swings in cortisol and sympathetic output than our male counterparts because we take on so much. And there's a reason why uh, we, we say, you know, it takes a village to raise a child, right? Or it takes a village to, to raise children. And it's because it literally does. Anyone who has a child, I mean, first, it's like the biggest personal development, you know, course you'll ever take, but it also is incredibly taxing on your energy if you are the only one delivering on the goods while trying to deal with the husband or the partner and the career and the house and the, all the, and the friendship and the social and all those other things. So this image that you're seeing, um, if I, 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 I purchased this from uh, like a, a photo uh, site, but it really should be, if I, if I were to do it myself, it would really be bi-directional. These arrows are, when we, when we think about the effects of chronic stress, this is going to affect the, uh, our gut function. It's going to improve, in, increase the hyperpermeability of the gut is going to change our food choices. So we are going to, when we are in a state of stress, we are going to reach for the sugary foods. We are gonna reach for the comfort because we want that quick little serotonin hit that the gut is gonna produce for us when we eat those simple uh, carbohydrates. 
it is going to lead to immune dysfunction. And of course, on your right side here, you can see that um, you know, a lot of these are lifestyle uh, diseases. And I include cancer in here because, and cancer is sort of an umbrella term, but there, and there are a couple of punch outs where it is very much dictated by your genetic makeup. But there has been a lot of discussion, especially with cancer, that it is, a, it is more of a metabolic issue. There is endocrine uh, dysregulation that is driving the cancer. And of course, we see depression, cardiovascular disease, diabetes. These are all things that we can, that are within our control to be able to, um, to uh, improve. So that's leptin and that's cortisol. Now I want to talk a little bit about menstruation, right? One of the easily, you know, one of the most distinguishable, distinguishable blessings of being a woman is that you get a period and that you have the opportunity to create life. And I think it's important. And I, uh, this really came to my attention. It was about two years ago. I, I was presenting to a, a group of female uh, entrepreneurs and I was like, okay, we're just going to really quickly go over our menstrual cycle. They had no clue, like no clue the ebbs and flows of uh, their period, their energy levels, how that affected their mood, um, you know, how talkative they are versus in different times of the month, how much energy they have, when to lift weights. So I think it's, it's important for a woman to really harness the energy that we have and the ebbs and flows uh, that we have during our menstrual cycle. So um, it's worth noting, just in case you're not aware, that every single month that you have, uh, that you are cyclical and that you have a period, you are creating a new organ. That is so important. It's worth saying again, it, you are creating a new organ every single month. And this is true for, uh, perimenopausal women as well, right? So if you're in your forties, you are still that, that reproductive drive is still building up that endometrial lining every single month, whether or not you want the kid, whether or not you want the fertilized egg, your body will drive that. That is your biological rhythm to create that endometrial lining every month. And what I want women to really understand is your menstruation is a vital sign. So in, if you were to go to a hospital um, for whatever reason, they might take your temperature, they might look at your respiratory rate, they might look at your heart rate, uh, they might look at your blood pressure. They might look at your oxygenation. These are all vital signs. And it's, that's true for men and women. But for women, menstruation, your, how you bleed is a key insight into your hormonal balance. So let's give you a little crash course on your period, on your cycle, so that you have, I mean, and this is really like knowledge is truly power. When you actually know how you operate, then you can, when you know better, you can do better. So I love this. Um, this is from, uh, this image is from uh, a period tracking app that I use. It's called Clue. Um, no affiliation, just love them. Uh, they are, this is a, such a simplistic and elegant um, uh, uh, image. So if we are thinking about, and we're just assuming that, you know, a cycle is four weeks in length. Week one, I call this your bleed week. This is when you are shedding that endometrial lining. So that's that. If you look on this um, screen, you'll see that that's sort of that red arc, right? So it's about, you know, six days ish, right? So five to six days is, is uh, typically normal. And what we know about our hormones during this week is that our estrogen levels are very low, our progesterone levels are very low, our testosterone levels are very low. It's almost like a reset, right? It's almost like, ah, okay, everyone's going to go on vacation. You know, the hunger uh, and the craving and the uh, and the you know the bowel like the bowel movements are going to start working again. And you know, anyone who's had a period, we know like the best one of the best parts of getting your period is the period poos, right? It's like amazing to have all those bowel movements <laughs> in the first couple of days, and that's because your progesterone is all flat now. And as you'll see, uh, progesterone in week three and four uh, peaks, and that actually slows down your bowel movements. So you're pooing, you feel great, you know, your appetite, you're sleeping really well. Um, this is actually a great time when we're integrating nutritional, uh, when I'm integrating nutritional proxies for people. This is a great time to actually try the ketogenic diet if you've never tried it before, because your appetite signaling is so low. So it's a really, and your, your body in this sort of first two weeks of your cycle is much better suited 
to more aggressive. Uh, so if you are restricting your carbohydrates or you're restricting one macronutrient or for fasting. So this is a really great time for you to play with fasting if that is uh, something that you are considering. The second week is the week before ovulation. So this is now your period has stopped and you have not yet released an egg. Um, and the egg releases somewhere between day 12 to day 14 or 15, depending on the length of your cycle. This is when we feel flirty. This is when we feel sexy. This is when we feel extroverted. We probably are uh, looking for sex or very interested in sex at this point or, or more, so, more so than any other time during our cycle. And that's because if you look at the, um, the yellow line there, that's testosterone peaking. So one of the things that people actually don't realize is testosterone is actually our most abundant sex hormone. So a lot of, we often ascribe the phenotype of estrogen to women and testosterone to men. But women actually have uh, about 10 times more uh, testosterone in their bodies than estrogen. So te testosterone is our main sex hormone. And of course, we have the, the downstream uh, estrogen um, that, is, that is produced from that. So this is a really great time. Uh, and we'll talk about um, uh, movement. But I love women to go hard with heavy weights this week because we want to be profiting from that peak, that spike in testosterone in order to drive lean muscle mass. And this is a metabolic consideration as well, right? The more lean body mass you have right now and as you age, it is going to help you regulate your sugar, your blood sugar. The more muscle you have, the, uh, the better um, glucose disposal agent you are. So if you have carbohydrates, your muscles will actually sop that up like, uh, like a dry towel looking for water because your muscles require, and once the, the glucose gets into the muscle, it's kind of like Vegas. When it gets in there, it stays there. The, the glucose cannot get out of the muscle once it's been absorbed there. So I, I love resistance training all through the month. But this week in particular, heavy resistance training, and when I say heavy, I mean, you know, five to seven reps and you're, you're approaching fatigue. Like I want you to be lifting heavy. And before anybody has this thought run through their head, I will also just say, you cannot turn into the Hulk. You know, there is still such a fear for women with lifting heavy weights that we are going to turn into, you know, a roided up, jacked up uh, bodybuilder and... I can tell you that even if you wanted to do that, naturally you cannot because the amount of testosterone that you have, um, you know, relative to, to men is, uh, I think it's, um, I want to say it's like 11X or 10X less. So you can't, you can't, you, you can't, you are not going to turn into the Hulk, okay, unless you start uh, exogenously supplementing with testosterones. So lift heavy this week. That's the take home. Uh, and then you ovulate, right? So you pop out the egg from your, um, from your follicle. And then we move into what's called the luteal phase of your cycle. And now we completely change, right? First two weeks, you're like, I want sex. I'm beautiful. I'm flirty. I'm sexy. The second half, the entire hormonal landscape changes. Now we tend to, our, we tend to, uh, we tend to be more introverted during this time. We, uh, progesterone, uh, that I mentioned, uh, drops in week one and two. Now she starts her magnificent rise towards the end of week three. Um, so that's going to start to slow down your bowel movements. It is going to start stimulating your appetite. Women might start noticing more sleep disturbances during this time. Uh, increases in temperature as well. We may feel hotter. Um, and then week four is kind of a continuation of that. So progesterone reaches her peak at about day 21, day 22. So that's right at the beginning of week four. Any inflammatory issues? So we were talking about chronic low-grade inflammation before. Any, if you are, have excess uh, adipose tissue, if you are a type two diabetic, if you have irritable bowel, if you have hypertension, you, are, you tend to have premenstrual uh, syndrome or some of the symptoms that are associated with that, all those things are gonna get aggravated in this week because of progesterone's uh, um, uh, peak here. And we're also gonna see in week four, this is also really important uh, for my women because I, I want you to feel normal, is uh, you are gonna have increased metabolic requirements. Your body now is gobbling up glucose, amino acids, and free fatty acids because she's developing, she's driving that lining. So this is a time for you to actually increase your caloric intake. 
without shame. Okay. And with that, so we want to just like cut the cords around that because if you're hungry, cut the energetic cords around that. Cause if you're hungry in week four, that's normal. Your body actually needs more calories. And I don't mean like go to Hagen dazs and like clear out the store. I mean, increase your caloric intake 10 to 15%, right? It's, it's not, a, it's not, you know, you're not having like tubs and tubs of ice cream and tubs and tubs of chocolate. Although I'm a big fan of chocolate all through the menstrual cycle. Um, but just forgive, like just allow it to happen. It's like physiologically what you need. And this is probably the worst time um, to do a long-term fast because of that, that excess, um, caloric requirement. So that's kind of your crash course in your period. Um, there are um, lots of, you can kind of see that because of that, that ebb and flow of all of the progesterones, the testosterones, uh, the estrogens, that there is lots of opportunity for hormonal derangement, right? And I work a lot with women who you know, may have polycystic uh, ovarian syndrome, which is a which is a case where there's too much uh, testosterone, and that's not aromatizing well uh, to her estrogen levels or her insulin levels. There's it's a sort of a complicated dance when we talk about PCOS, but generally what we see is um, high insulin levels. Um, kind of throughout the month don't allow her to actually ovulate because we don't when those high insulin levels go up. Uh, there's a couple of other hormones I haven't mentioned here. One of them is luteinizing hormone. It doesn't allow that spike to allow for the um, for the follicle to uh, to release the release the egg. And this is actually why you know we're talking to keto the ketocon family. Of course, we're going to talk about keto today. Uh, so PCOS. If you are someone who knows that you have PCOS or you you suspect that. Uh, I can tell you with um, clinical certainty that uh, keto, uh, the ketogenic diet is wonderful, is wonderful for my ladies with PCOS, uh, along with uh, pairing that with some fasting. Um, all right. I want to come back to, um, so now we kind of know how our menstrual cycle works. I want to talk about this in the context of energy, right? Because we kind of go up and down through the month in terms of our energetic uh, production. This is a picture of a mitochondria, by the way, which I thought was just absolutely gorgeous. Um, so I want you to think about um, if you are someone who has identified with what I've been talking about today. So you're like, yep, I'm pretty sure I have leptin resistance. I don't know when to put the fork down. Yep. I have kids and I've been tired for the past 18 years. Yep. I have chronic low grade infl inflammation. Uh, I, I have a feeling like I'm reaching for the sugar or I need the coffee or, or what have you. How that changes you physiologically, it actually changes the, um, the way in which you produce energy. So typically energy, I'm going to give you maybe some nightmares from high school biology, but uh, typically energy, uh, the energetic currency is ATP, okay? So adenosine triphosphate. This is, the, this is like every single second, as I've been talking today, I've been producing thousands, you know, thousands and thousands of molecules of ATP. When you are in a state of chronic low-grade inflammation, when you're stressed, now, what happens is instead of creating this abundance of energy in the mitochondria, which is this beautiful structure that you see here that is in, it is in every, almost every single cell um, in the body, um, we are going to switch from being abundantly producing energy. We are going to switch, it, and that's called, um, for my hardcore bio nerds, that's oxidative phosphorylation. We're switching from oxidative phosphorylation to something called aerobic glycolysis. So it is less efficient. You're still producing it, um, but that is going to reduce the glucose availability that you have in the cell in order to make energy. And that's going to reduce, that's going to reduce your, your capacity for output. And of course, the other you know, consequence of that is when you move from this oxfos to aerobic glycolysis is now you have more oxidative damage that's also being created. For every single ATP molecule that is being created, you are now producing more what's called reactive oxygen species or ROS um, for short. Your insulin sensitivity reduces, you reduce the glucose that's available in the cell, and now, now you're kind of feeling you know, um, uh, like your, your energy slumps. So all this to say that there, I mean, I, 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 I don't want it to be all doom and gloom. We are all, you know, unique. We all have different unique hormonal profiles, but we can, there are things that we can do to 
change those things. So I want to move into some of the solutions that have really worked well uh, for people who I have worked with. I work, you know, one-on-one -on -one with clients and I also have an online program. Uh, it's called the Estima Diet. And really what we're doing is we're trying to change a woman's energetic production, what I like to call cellular grit. We are changing her architecture, her cellular architecture, and then building on a strong foundation. And like anything, in order to change our, you know, in order to change our scenario, we need to go inward, right? So we need to go inward from a metabolic perspective, from a circadian biology perspective, and of course, an, a, you know, a psycho-spiritual, neuro-spiritual uh, perspective um, as well. And I just want to pause here and say that it is my philosoph it is my philosophy um, that I believe with every single cell in my body that your it is your divine right <laughs> to be healthy. Your body wants that. And symptoms, although they can be uncomfortable, uh, whether that's, you know, I mentioned PCOS, there's many other, there's low testosterone, there's estrogen dominance, there's all these, uh, you know, different permutations of hormonal uh, derangement and symptom profiling. But whatever silo, you know, you fit in, those symptoms are an invitation for you to pay attention to yourself. It's not your body, your body is not punishing you. It is just saying, hey, please, like, I'm here, like, this is what I need, right? I need you to pay attention to this because I'm trying to tell you that everything is not right. So I just, I just want to say that because I believe that our bodies will naturally move towards uh, homeostasis and to it is it is in our capacity to express um, health. So first thing, easy thing, when we talk about uh, the first thing that we can do, it is working on our circadian biology. And the first place I usually work with, with people, uh, is their sleep. And I often joke that sleep is like the cheapest diet on the planet. You don't have to sign up for anything. All you got to do is just commit to eight hours. You go eight, like I will give you a challenge right now, eight hours a night for the next seven nights, and you will see your belly drop. You will see your energy levels skyrocket. You will wake up happy. You're going to have less uh, brain fog and you're actually going to be more motivated to eat right and exercise in the way that your body requires and expects. So I'm sure that there's a lot of, you've heard, you know, some of the great uh, tips for hygiene in terms of sleep hygiene. Uh, I'll just review very quickly cold room, dark room, right? So we want the room to be cold. Uh, if you're American, that would be 65 to 68 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. The rest of the world, that's like 15 to 18 degrees centigrade. Uh, we want it to be dark. And actually, I'll say the reason why we want it to be cold in the room is so that under the covers, you're kind of getting up to 72, right? So if you have like 65 to 68 degrees uh, Fahrenheit in the room, under your nice warm woolly covers, you're, you're getting to that body temperature of about uh, 72. Dark room, obviously, melatonin, the hormone of darkness, we want to be uh, driving that. No device use. Remove the TV that's in your room. Put it, in, put it somewhere else. No like, don't allow phones, iPads, none of those things in your room. Um, if you travel a lot, one of the things that I have actually found to work really well, because uh, you're sleeping in a new place, maybe it's a new time zone, uh, you know, the, the room is not your little nest. Um, I actually find wearing socks, like making the room as su super cold as, as the thermostat will allow and wearing socks to bed. And what that does is it actually charms the heat. So if you have, you know, your socks on and your feet are getting nice and toasty, it actually charms the heat away from your core body temperature and in, into your extremities and it allows you to sleep well. So I've given that uh, little tip to uh, lots of people who travel sort of across time zones a lot and it seems to really uh, help. So I'd love for you to try it and let me know um, what you think. Uh, don't eat right before bed, right? That's a natural, right? If your stomach's full and then you lay uh, on your back, of course, now you're working against gravity, very likely to have, uh, you know, sort of like this GERD, these GERD type symptoms. So two to three hours uh, before you uh, go to sleep should be your last meal. And uh, another topic entirely would be lots of sex and orgasms, but uh, lots of, you know, ways for you to release, for you to get into that parasympathetic and then drift off into, uh, into sleep. Sex and orgasms are nature's lunesta. All right. Now, some of the fun stuff for my KetoCon. This is why you came <laughs> uh, to learn more about uh, nutritional uh, proxies for uh, energy. So let's talk about green leafy vegetables. Um, 
And particularly, I love the brassica family. So I always call the brassica family the Kardashians of the green leafy vegetables. There's so many different kinds and they're all beautiful. You can't really pick which one is your favorite. And when we, when we think about the brassica family, green leafy vegetables, things like kale and broccoli and Swiss chard and bok choy and all the beautiful greens uh, that you see here. These, there are certain compounds in the brassica family. Uh, there's indole, so indole-3-carbonol, uh, sulforaphanes, um, isothiocyanates. There is a direct link, direct link from consuming these vegetables and a reduction in all-cause mortality. So in normal speak, what that means is the more of these foods that you consume, the less likely it is for you to die from all causes, all causes of death, okay? Also heart disease, reduced uh, mortality from cardiovascular disease, which women, as much as uh, we think that cancer is our number one killer, it is heart disease. Cardiovascular disease is the number one killer for women. Uh, consuming these vegetables also improve our lipid profiles. They improve our breast cancer risk, right? They decrease uh, inflammatory pathways like the NF-kappa B pathway. Uh, it inhibits DNA damage, increases uh, benzene excretion. Um, and if, if that doesn't convince you, you know, let's just talk vanity, right? You live longer, you reduce your DNA damage, but you also have better skin, better hair, better nails, you know, reduces balding. It's, it's been shown to reduce balding um, in mice and it increases lipolysis, which is um, the breakdown in fat. So if I can't get you on the NF-kappa B thing, uh, you got better hair, skin, and nails, okay? So eat more of these puppies. Also really important for ladies with PCOS, right? It helps for, it helps with reducing or improving uh, the insulin uh, response um, uh, in women with PCOS. Lots, lots of fat. For many years, and I know that it is changing because we have events like KetoCon now, but for many, many, many years, we were told that fat is to be avoided at all costs. Um, but of course, even if you just think about this from your, your brain, if you just look at the organ, it is just a blob of fat with lots of wires in it. You need fat. So uh, I've mentioned uh, the Estima diet. This is something that is, is, a, is a tenant of this program avocados, olive oils, nuts, seeds. And they, it, these have been studied to, when we think about satiation, so if we're thinking about improving our leptin sensitivity, having more fat is one way to do it. You are going to feel full faster, and that is going to help your leptin signaling uh, in your brain. Of course, when you're eating uh, the right fats, you are going to be reducing uh, inflammation. There's almost no insulin response. Uh, there's kind of like a little negligible one when you have fat, but it's, it's like night and day compared to when you eat a carbohydrate and it's broken down into glucose. Um, and then for women, when we're thinking about the ketogenic diet for women, this is actually uh, very, very important. So there's, there's a way that guys do keto or can get away with keto. Uh, and then there's ways that women need to do keto. And I've been kind of outlining a little bit, like the green leafy vegetables should be a hallmark for women, as well as these types um, of fats. Because what I often find is some of the people now that join the program, they're like, well, I tried keto, it didn't really work for me. And you know, kind of two, two to three weeks later, I was just like so hungry, I, for, I forgot it. But this is actually the way uh, when you are pairing the insoluble fiber and the, all the benefits of the brassica family from the green leafy vegetables and, and good fats is how you can actually keep this type of eating going for um, the long term. There are some questions around fasting. Um, this is something that I, I could completely do a different, uh, a completely different presentation on fasting. Um, there are different ways that you can fast. So I want you to think about fasting as like pulling three levers, right? You can pull the lever of the type of fast. So there's different types of fast. You can do a water fast. You can do a bone broth fast. So there's some cat, like that would be called a caloric liquid fast. So there's like you're consuming calories there. Um, how long, that's another lever, right? So the length of your fast, so that can be a daily fast, it can be a 24 hour fast, it can be a 72 hour fast. And then the frequency, that's another lever that you can pull when it comes to fasting. So how often do you do this every day? Is there a longer fast that you do every month, maybe during your bleed week? Um, is there, do you do a longer fast quarterly? So there's like different ways that you can come up with a fasting regimen for yourself. Um, for women, I am not a big fan of long-term fasts. 
especially if you have any type of hormonal derangement that has not yet been addressed. So I kind of mentioned it before. I see it all the time online. Um, lots of health uh, experts, lots of gurus that I, that I love and respect, love and respect. Um, but they're men and they, you know, not, they don't know. <laughs> like you just, if you're, I mean, of course you can study it, but it is one thing to have the information around fasting. It is another thing for the application. Information, application, two different things. And what I have found clinically uh, over the several years that I have been working with fasting and women is that for the most part, we don't actually do well uh, when you are fasting longer than 72 hours. And even at 72 hours, there's only a few people, there's only sort of a little subset of people that I, that I like uh, to do 72 hour fast. So that is once you have cleared out any estrogen, uh, metabol metabolism issues, uh, your testosterone is, am is, is balanced. You don't have low test. Like there's all these different things, uh, that we play around with, with, um, with females. And if you jump and, and I just also want to say that fasting like keto is a tool, right? It is a tool in your tool belt to amplify your metabolic health. And if you are, um, so it is a, it is a form of uh, hormesis or it is a form of, um, it is a good stress, but it is still a stress at the end of the day. And if you have, you know, a metabolic profile that is already a stack of, you know, a deck of cards that's easily, you know, falling over, fasting for long periods of time are, is also going to uh, change the way that you sleep. I've had many, uh, Many women say that it is uh, messed up their menstrual cycle. I've also experienced that as well. I used to think I was like, ah, all the guys are doing it. I'm going to do a five day fast. I could do it. I'm strong, strong like bull over here. And then like lost my period for two or three months. So, you know, doing a five to seven day fast is not something that I recommend a without, you know, supervision, but generally for women, I don't really like it. So I love for most types of women, uh, a daily a time restricted eating. So kind of restricting your eating window, but you're still eating every day, 24 hours, still same thing. You're still eating every day. And then as you improve your fasting tolerance and as your hormonal profile improves, then we can also improve and change some of those levers that I was talking about before. So we can have longer fasts, we can do them more often, um, but that is best done um, by monitoring some of your, um, uh, monitoring some of the, like your blood glucose, your fasting insulin, fasting glucose, how you respond, what your postprandial glucose is. Like it, it's like an entire different um, uh, presentation. All right, let's let's talk about um, this slide. Shouldn't be in here. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, let's talk a little bit about. Okay, so this is devices. We've we've covered this as well. We're talking about intermittent. We've talked about. Well, let's actually talk a little bit about intermittent fasting. So, uh, intermittent fasting is really. Uh, it's a catch-all term, right? We use intermittent fasting like, oh, I intermittent. What we're really talking about is eating every single day. I prefer the term time-restricted uh, eating window. Uh, you're still eating every day. So I typically will start someone, if you've never fasted before, a really nice protocol would be 12-12. So that means that you are eating in, you have 12 hours to eat you know, the food that you've planned to eat that day. Uh, and then you are fasting for 12 hours. And in that fasted period, uh, most of that's going to be sleep. So if you think about, you know, you wake up in the morning, maybe you start your food, like you have a cup of coffee and your breakfast uh, at seven in the morning, that's when the time starts. So you have until 7 p.m. to finish eating all your foods. Over time, you'll find, most people find that really easy, really doable. Over time, I tend to tighten that window up. Uh, I tend to like women to eat between an eight and a nine uh, hour eating window. And uh, so that what that means is a 15 or 16 hour uh, fast. And it takes a little bit of time to work up there. But what we know about, especially in terms of breast cancer research, is women, so there was this really, and I'll send you the study uh, for those of you that want to read it. There was uh, women who had had breast cancer in the past and they said, okay, we're not going to change their diet, but we're just going to change the fast. So the eating window that, um, that they consume their food in during the day. So it didn't change their food. So it wasn't even like, it was just like, it wasn't keto, it wasn't paleo, it wasn't any of the, like, the good stuff that we've been talking about. It's just you eat whatever you want, just make sure that you eat it within eight or nine hours. And what they found was over time, there was a 40%, 40 
40% without controlling for the food, just the time, 40% reduction in the recurrence of breast cancer in those patients. Like how freaking powerful is that? Not even, not even like have good fats, have green leafy vegetables, just eat in eight hours. So that's where I love uh, to bring women in terms of, um, uh, in terms of their fasting. Movement, again, it's another presentation, but I want to give you as much of my heart and my mind as I can. So I, what I often find with women uh, who say, well, you know what, I go, to, I go to class like four or five times a week and I'm working out and I just can't seem to drop the weight. When I ask what, what they're doing, it tends to be high intensity interval training four to five times a week. And as a woman, you are not designed to, do, I'm sorry, soul cycle, but we're not supposed to be soul cycling four or five times a week. You are not supposed to be going that crazy. And when you are increasing that stress four to five times a week without allowing yourself to recover, uh, what you are signaling to your bodily body is that you are running away from some sort of predator and you keep having to run away from that some sort of predator. You are keeping yourself in that sympathetic dominance and you don't allow yourself to recover. So we've talked a little bit about, as I was talking about the menstrual cycle, I was talking a little bit about like week two, you know, ovul pre-ovulatory, that's like a really good time for heavy weights. Um, all through the month is really a good time for resistance training, but it's the type of training that you do uh, that, that really matters here. So in week one of your, uh, of your menstrual cycle, I really like more moderate weights. So something where you're lifting, um, between eight and 10 or even up, upwards of 12 repetitions of, of whatever exercises you're doing. So if you're just starting out, it would be an upper and lower body split or a full body. You're just maybe doing four sets of four to five different exercises. And you're doing that within each set you're doing eight to 12 reps. That's what I would call moderate um, uh, exercise. I'd also replicate that in week three of your menstrual cycle as well. Week two, we've talked about heavy weights. So again, like you know, three to four sets, and then the repetitions are five to seven, so super duper heavy. And then in week four, because we tend to be more inflamed, I tend to like to extend the repetition. So I like the reps to be somewhere between 15 to 20, but you're doing less, right? So you're not doing like five to six exercises. You're doing maybe three to four exercises, uh, three sets, and then we're doing 15 to 20. And you're still honoring the, you know, the, the way to, to drive muscle hypertrophy. So, you know, science suggests that as long as you're doing somewhere between 10 sets, 10 to nine to 10 sets a week, you're going to be growing muscle, but it's the way in which you are doing those repetitions that really matter. And that's how we honor our hormonal um, milieu through the, through the month. And I also like there to be recovery you know, I don't think that recovery is really talked about as much as, uh, as it should. This is where all your gains happen. You know, we like to think that if we push ourselves and push ourselves and push ourselves, that we're going to, you know, look like some Photoshop picture on Instagram. But the reality is, is when you allow yourself to rest and recover, that is where your gains happen. And if you continue to do the high intensity interval training five or six times a week, your body is going to sense that as a distress signal and it's going to hold on to your fat like an insurance policy. So we want to think about recovery, yoga, Pilates, general movement, right? That's, you know, kind of another uh, soapbox that I, I tend to get up on is that we are such movement specialists now, right? Like we go to CrossFit and I love CrossFit, like nothing, you know, love CrossFit, but that's all that we do. And then we just go back to our desks and we sit for eight hours, right? What about trying to be more general, like a movement generalist? Let's try to get a little bit more steps in. Let's try to walk a little bit more. Let's garden a little bit, you know, clean your house like your mother-in-law is coming over, right? Like these things are ways that we can increase our thermogenesis, that we can increase our caloric expenditure, but they're much gentler, right? And they're much more in tuned with, um, with, uh, with living, with a living a healthy life. So kind of wrapping, uh, this up, the last, um, place I really want to focus on is finding, and this is, you know, through exercise and movement and other practices, I want you to try to find a way to fall back in love with yourself and bring some of the things that bring you joy. And, you know, sometimes I'll ask, you know, driven women, I'll be like, what, what brings you joy? You know, what makes you happy? And they like stare at me like, what's she talking about? What do you mean joy? What is that? Um, so 
things, I'll just kind of give you a list. Some of them may land, some of them may not. Um, you know, walking in nature, grounding, getting your feet in the grass, right? Or if you live near water, uh, you know, exposing yourself to some of the ions um, and the breeze and the, you know, the scent of the salt water, if you are so lucky to live by salt water, manicuring your nails, getting, delivering flesh, fresh flowers to yourself every week. Like it doesn't have to be expensive, but it has to be meaningful to you, right? One, we can talk about all the diet and all the movement and the hormones this and the hormones that. At the end of the day, if you don't like yourself, you know, it's all for naught, right? So we want to be thinking about what you desire and what you really want. Um, one of the things that's been really helpful for me is creating a desire list. Like, what do I want to create? If I'm not creating a human, right? If I'm not going to be uh, creating any more children, I mean, you know, my shop's closed for, for baby making. What can I use my creative powers to create in my life? What do I desire? So I just want to leave that to marinate a little bit with you because when we as women can be attuned to and turned on to what we want and we understand the way that we work, you are setting yourself up for joy, for pleasure, which I think, you know, again, a different topic, but we are pleasure deficient. Um, and you're setting yourself for, up for a life that you deserve. Like you deserve to be happy and you deserve to feel good in your body. Um, so start working on your desire muscles um, as well. So this is me. Um, if you want to learn, I talk about all these things on my podcast. Uh, it is my baby. Uh, I, it's called Better with Dr. Stephanie. Uh, also very active um, on Instagram. So if you want to find me there at Dr. Stephanie Estima. And then uh, if you want to check out more of my programs and my offerings, uh, www.drstephanieestima.com. I hope it is my sincere hope and desire that this has been useful for you. I know that you're very busy, you're very important and spending this time listening to a woman that you may not know who I am, but you know, if you've spent the time, I am so grateful for your attention. I know that that's another currency that we work in is our paying attention. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs>